Hello, MicroLive this month features one of the most useful applications for the home micro, and for that matter, the business micro, word processing. With me are four people who regularly use a typewriter professionally, but have never touched a word processor before. So seated at four home micros are Katie Steele, who's Hello. a secretary, using the BBC micro. Hello, Kate. Hello. John Humphreys, familiar. Change from reading the news this, John. A bit of a difference. He's with an Atari 800XL. Bernard, Bernard Adams, who is a television producer with the Commodore 64. Welcome, Bernard. Hello. And finally, writer Jill Tweedy, who's using a, what is it, Sinclair, Sinclair. QL. Yes, right. no experience at all with no. word processing. No. It's going to be very exciting for you. Yeah. Well, they've got about three quarters of an hour to see if they can learn enough to be able to copy this letter and print it out and make some changes to it. Well, usually, the manuals are pretty daunting. So we've asked the manufacturers to boil down the basics onto just one sheet of paper. John Cole, welcome John Cole. He's here to see fair play and to give them the maximum time we're setting them going now, before the show really starts. Today we hope to make the first ever televised transatlantic telephone call. We'll call up our American reporter Freff using a new service just launched in this country called Cellular Radio. And Freff will also be looking at some of the bizarre phones on sale in New York. Nowadays in the world of telephones, anything goes. Even this. How about one of those in your bathroom? Four on the bar of soap. <laughs> we'll be looking at some educational software for young children with Fred Harris, our software sleuth, and we'll be announcing the winners of our integrated software challenge. And how are supercomputers changing the way that like, films like this are made? Fred reports from Hollywood. Terrific. Well, the sun is announced last week that the bonanza in home computer sales is over. Well, this filled the city with gloom and wiped five pence off Acorn shares overnight. The article also predicted that many fledgling hardware and software companies will go under this year. Microlive has been conducting its own investigation. Leslie. We found that although competition is very intense, there is no sign of a collapse in the UK market. In fact, most surveys agree that sales in 84 at over 2 million home micros are slightly higher than sales in 83. Two leading retailers told us that there is a large upturn in the sales of peripherals. Software has also held up well. Smith's describing sales before Christmas as hectic. So which home micros won the Christmas sales battle? Our figures all agree that the Sinclair Spectrum came out ahead increasing its share of the market of computers below £1,000 to about 36%. Next came the Commodore 64 with about a quarter of that market, and then the Acorn Electron, followed by the Amstrad, MSX and Atari. Even after Atari's price cut, only got 2 and 3% of the market. Mm. Now, the Sunday Times claims one market analyst said the BBCB is sinking into oblivion. Well, apart from the fact that the market analyst told us that he'd never said anything like that, the BBCB does still hold 75% of the... Three to 500 pound computer market with nearly half a million machines sold so far so it's hardly oblivion is it Mike? well not quite no well the reason the city is jittery is that many market analysts have said that the home computer market has got nowhere to go eventually everyone will get bored with a kind of software that machines under 200 pounds are capable of running the market for computers is obviously going to change but for the sunday times to tell the boom is over is a little bit premature hmm. Next week sees the final of the CFAC Make Your Move Primary School Chess Championships. There have been over 6,000 entries and you can watch the moves being made live on pages 193 and 194 of CFAX. In fact, the quarterfinals are underway at this very moment between Alexander Green of Spring Hill School, Southampton and Simon Jury of Houston Primary School, Glasgow. The semi-finalists and finalists are going to be entering their moves on BBC micros from their own schools using modems and telephone links direct into the CFAX computer. 
Well, the sign organizer is probably one of the smallest devices you could actually call a micro on the market. It comes with a plug-in 8K EEPROM pack, and you can store and retrieve data, edit it, and do calculations. Well, now it's possible to transmit the data using this connection either to a full-size computer or to a printout, so it becomes quite effective as a data collection device. One thing that particularly intrigued me was how to switch it off. On is easy. That's the on switch. You switch it on, and on it goes. Off is very puzzling. It took me a long time to find out how you do it. What you do is you press the mode switch until you get into the off mode, and then you execute the off mode, and it switches off. Quite obvious, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Making a meal out of the obvious, though. Oh, dear. Number one in the game software charts at the moment is Ghostbusters by Activision, which ties in with the film of the same name. Now Argus Software announces news of their latest tie-in, Give My Regards to Broadway. Broad Street, I should say. Sorry, Paul McCartney. Well, Paul McCartney himself was very involved with the design, as he didn't want a sort of shoot 'em up type of game, but rather one involving strategy and music. The game involves nine... 143 scrolling screens and a complete map of the London Underground system, but it won't be available until the first week in February. We've had drummers getting into computers, now we've got guitarists and singers. It'll never end. The whole mm -hmm. business is getting overcrowded. And more news about bulletin board. We've had so many people trying to get on that the disks have overflowed and the system has clogged its way to a standstill. Now we're glad to say that we've got a 15 megabyte hard disk system from Tandy, so we'll be back in business with much more information than before. Remember, the numbers in the Radio Times. Now, if you bought a Christmas micro to help with the children's maths, you may feel a little bit like Mrs. Alison Harvey, who wrote to us saying that she couldn't find any information recommending good educational software. Well, Fred Harris has been looking at some of the software that concentrates on learning numbers particularly. Now, Fred, where do you start with all well, this? Well, first of all, don't assume that a school's package, no matter how good it is, is going to be equally good at home, because it need not be. For example, here's a school's package. I think it was written for schools. It's called Fence, and it comes from Hodder and Stoughton. The idea is to guess how many of these fence units you need to go right round the field. Okay, so, have a go. go. Yeah. Um, let's see what it says to 18. I see, and you get a red line going round. Oh, right. not Too enough. Few. Um, guess again. 30. I bet there's going to be too many. Uh, oh! No, you've done it, and you get some sheep in the field, you see. How do you know those are sheep, Fred? Well, I'm not sure, really. They're a bit I small, see. aren't they? What hmm. else does it do? Well, that's just about it, you see. That's the trouble. Uh, my eight-year-old played this twice and then said, haven't we got anything else? Yeah, I can it's understand got an why. It's span of about five minutes. But, that's, of course, that's OK for schools, because you've got couple of hundred kids at five minutes each that's mm. great but it's a very expensive five minutes for a home user i tell you what looking at this it says it's an exciting colorful original pack yes but exciting just means it's on a computer and colorful means it's on a, a color computer so thing. don't always believe the back of the pack no. say okay what would you recommend as a good home-based package well i think this is quite good really this one tests or helps to uh, practice your mental arithmetic in fact it's really about tables it's called right. robot tables so Let's have a go. F for fast. Here we go. Oh, we're into the demo mode. That's a shame. Never mind. We'll just skip through this. Plenty of instructions on screen, you see, so yep. you don't need a handbook with it. Now, here we are. This simple. is a machine which builds robots, mm -hmm. and the raw material coming in, I don't know if you spotted it there, had a number two on it. Yep. Now, you have to either accept or reject that number, depending on whether you think it's a table. If right. you get it right, you get a good robot, yep. zooming along there. If you get it wrong, then it either goes up in smoke, or uh, not the micro, the machine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> get a wonky yeah, robot. Yeah. It's actually quite fun and quite it's addictive. It's nice, isn't it? It doesn't actually teach tables, though, does it? No, no, it's just practising, but then very few of the, uh, the things around do actually yeah. teach anything. They're only... Good practicing. confirming and testing. That's right. And yeah. it's also very colourful. Well, yes, it now, looks... It I mean, it, it looked very nice, that. There's yeah. a lot going on. It's nice and busy. It makes you want to play it. Yes, but you do need more than that. I mean, this is colourful, too. Look. Oh, that's nice. Well, it does look very impressive, but what do you make of this? Uh, press any key for each missing object. That's double Dutch. It is. What does it, it mean? Well, I've seen ten people flummoxed by that. In fact, we worked out eventually that it means it's an adding up. Mm. You have to press a key for each of the objects that are here. Yeah. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right, OK, so press yeah. a key. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, and then and, what? And, uh, ah, well, you've actually got to press this, but it doesn't tell you to. See? So you really have to know, you have to guess a little bit within the instructions as to what to do well, next. Well, it's very confusing on-screen yeah. instructions. And then all that happens is a little bird laughs at the end mm. of it if you've got it right. Not very but exciting. In, 
Well, in that case, is it a nice strong backup for the current education? Well, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure because a lot of teachers would argue with why is this in block capital letters? Children are learning to read in low case, yeah. and why a three layer addition? Because number pairs are far more useful. It's more important to know that four and four is eight than that one add three add four is eight. Right. So Okay, um, you've got your very own sort of consumer test at home, oh, haven't yes. you? Oh, yes. I have an eight-year-old consultant who has been addicted to this one here. Okay. This is called Number Painter, and it's available, or Number Builder. It's yeah. available for all kinds of micros under different guises. Well, now, you have a go with a joystick okay. there. What you've got to do is scoot a little man around here. Okay. There oh, he goes. Oh, and you can pick up numbers. You've got to make this target figure here, what 12, what and you're starting with 3. You've got to get to oh, 12 somehow. Up a ladder. Up a ladder. The Hello. great thing Take here it, oh is... Oh, no, I've taken it away. Ah, not to worry. No, I've taken you, it away again. You can always correct your mistakes, you see. And go that way and pick up nine. Nine, great. Is that going to alter it? Yep, three. three. How about that? You've done I've it. I've done it. Now, of course, there are Fabulous. all kinds of ways of doing that. He's you can throw yourself in at the deep end it. or you can plan your route. Yeah. Very, very exciting game. Very compulsive. The nice thing about this is that you can't ever really get it wrong. You either end up going above your total figure or below it, and then you have to adjust. Something else, too. It actually adjusts to your level. If you're having a hard time, it gives you an easier game next time. On the other hand, if you, if you wipe the board with it, it'll challenge you more and more yeah. and more. And you Very play good. against the clock as well in the shape of this bucket. Don't it's you? a great program. I wish I'd written it. Yeah, it's Smashing. a nice one. Now there is more to mathematics though, than just arithmetic, isn't there? Much, much more. Maths is is mainly about pattern and shape and symmetry and logic and reasoning and all kinds of other things. In fact, here's a jolly good maths package. You probably think it's a graphics package, and in fact, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. But there's a lot of maths in it. You can use these picture elements here, all yeah. these different shapes, to build almost, well, anything you like. In fact, I caught you playing with it first thing this morning, I didn't was, I? I was, and the thing I liked about it was that I was able to pick up what to do with it just by looking at the instructions. Very easy and to And if use. I can, anybody can. And it's from Hilditch Software, and yeah. there's another example of some of the stuff it'll do. And it's very very versatile. Because most Marvelous. people wouldn't recognise that really as maths. I mean, it's pretty pictures, but they're all geometric symbols, aren't they? There's all kinds of Excellent. maths in there. And Smash I, it. I guess that would last a lifetime, it but you indeed. like it. I do indeed, yes. Yeah. I'll be playing that for ages. Yeah. Now, here's one that won't last a lifetime. This is one that you can, uh, you can use once and once only. It's mm -hmm. a kind of a challenge, a puzzle. You've got to work out the rule, how many bounces it would take for a ball to go from this corner to one of the other corners in that grid. Um, so, pick a number. Um, six. Okay, six. So We'll try A random guess, you understand. Here it goes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wrong. Uh -huh. I was wrong. Well, now there is a rule. Now, and your job is to find out what that rule is. I see. And you can set up little experiments, different size grids, yeah. until you get the rule. So you gradually deduce by all the mistakes you make what the rule it's is. It's a lovely piece of investigative maths. Very nice. Like but presumably, once you've got the rule, you've cracked it, and the That's life right. of the game is over. That's right. So it's not the sort of thing you choose to buy, mm -hmm. which is why we're sort of giving it away to the lucky few that have got uh, tele software able to get that. Mm. Or for those of you who can get in onto the bulletin board via yeah. a modem, they, they can download this for absolutely nothing. Oh, that's it's a smashing phone. It's called Bounce. Nice. Now listen, we've heard a lot of information, but can you sort of sum it up? Are there some simple guidelines for parents looking for educational software? I think the first thing is find out what the problem is, and that means talking to the child as well as perhaps to the yeah. teacher. Uh, secondly, don't buy anything until you've seen it in action. Go along to the shop and demand mm -hmm. to see it. WH Smith tell me they will always show games if they're asked to. If you can see it going, then be a bit of a wally, press the wrong keys, see if it crashes, see what happens. Um, and of course, finally, most important, make it fun or it just won't get used. Yeah, and to answer Mrs. Harvey's letter briefly, we turn for advice. A ah, bit more difficult, that. I've put several addresses on the bulletin board and in the notes, um, but there's a, the, the real specialists are the MEP, Micro Electronics okay. and Education. And anyone who really wants to can send Thank for you. the programme notes or dive into the bulletin board and get that information. That's right. Thanks very much indeed, Fred. Now, you may remember that we've been following the fortunes of superstar Brian Jacks, who bought an Atari Micro for himself and his family a few months ago. Well, we've been back to see how he's been getting on with it. Oh! Well, perhaps you can hear that uh, the computer is actually reloading at the moment, and we've put uh, Jungle's Rainbow in, which uh, is a children's game, and it uh, teaches the child above and below. But uh, I set the thing up once, loaded the program, it went through onto the screen, and uh, I pressed the wrong button on the computer, and we had to start again. Oh, here we are. It's just loaded up now. Right, come let's have a look at this one. You better go at this one before. So. Basically, I think it's uh, it's a fairly good game, but the, the only problem is that all it really teaches the child is above and below and left and right. 
I mean, the Atari graphics are, are fabulous, but if you look at the price of it, for instance, it's £23. I would believe it's uh, an exorbitant price to pay for that kind of tape. And that's underneath the line. It's going to go down there. Look. Julie, on the other hand, is doing very well with the Atari writer. I found it a little bit difficult at first, so a friend advised me to go to Orpington College and they were very helpful there. Apparently they do courses for uh, mothers uh, during the day, you know, whose children are at school. Mrs Coles, one of the teachers at the college, was able to show me how to use the word processor and she gave me some of her time and we went through it all and I was very impressed. So delete a word, take your cursor back to the T. And here we have delete word. word, delete word. And then I just carry on as normal. Just carry on time. Lovely. I've played around quite a lot with um, with a lot of the games and also with a lot of the educational programmes. And if you look at the Atari logo you put the cartridge in the top of the machine. The thing comes up and all you've got is just uh, two or three lines. And then you have to sit there and sift through a massive great book um, and try to work out where you go from there. It's OK if you understand a bit about the language, which I don't. So it took me a long time. I spent about four hours last night trying to get the bug onto the screen to make it look a square. It is rather difficult for somebody who hasn't actually learned any of the basic before. However, Julie's getting on very, very well with the Atari writer. Um, there are certain things on the Atari writer that are very easy. The, the graphics on the screen, the actual writing, changing the paragraphs and so on. The only thing we found is that in using the cassette here, it takes a long time, A, to load the program. And if we'd like to save anything, um, any of the letters she types or anything like this, then um, it, it's such a, a long, long process. So I think we really need um, a disk drive unit, which we can save on and, and run the thing much quicker on. So Julie's going to get one for Christmas. <laughs> well, I can hear a lot of rattling from our amateur word processors as they clatter away there. We'll see how they're getting on in a minute or two. But first of all, I thought we might look at a few of the principles involved. Typing a letter out using an ordinary typewriter is fine until you realise you've made a mistake. And we've got a representation of a typewriter here and a piece of paper as it clatters across the screen. And there it goes. It's rather nice. This is part of a software package by the BBC Radio for Schools called Computers at Work. And it links an audio cassette here with the actual software on the micro itself. Well, we can see from this letter we've got two mistakes here. One is a hoppy instead of a happy. And we've got some fiends here instead of friends. That's the letter missed out. Now, all we have to do is to set this thing going and at the same time set the, the Now, tape if you going. have an ordinary typewriter, you'd need to rub out or paint over the O in hoppy and type in A. Then you'd have to rub out everything on the line after the F of fiend to make space for the new letter, the letter R. And then retype the whole line. Oh, thank you very much, Fred. That's very nice. But of course, you might want to put this paragraph here. We'd all like to wish you a happy birthday right at the end of the letter. And that means you'd have to retype the whole letter once again. Now, let's look at how our word processor would handle it. And this is part of the same package. And we can see here exactly the same letter. We've got the mistake in the hoppy. We've got the mistake in the fiends. And, the, and our word processor would look something like this. The O would be eliminated and replaced with an A. An R will be inserted and automatically the line will be pushed along. The paragraph we want to move will be marked and it would instantly be moved. Of course, if I was actually doing it myself, all the moving, it wouldn't quite be as fast as that. Well, when you're absolutely pleased with the results that you've got here, you just type it out and print the letter on some sort of printer. So let's see how our guinea pigs are getting on. John, are they hitting any problems? <laughs> Oh, one or two, yes. It's quite interesting, actually. One or two, as we'll see in a minute, have found it almost impossible to get going. But once they've got going, uh, they've managed quite well. It's interesting, actually, Kate here has managed uh, really quite well. And we've got the text in on the screen with quite a lot of success. What yes. problems have you found, Kate? I haven't found many at all. I had difficulty centering the your seal. I'm not quite sure how to do it. But You I... found out how to correct the errors? Oh, yes, yeah. Would you yeah. know how to make the letter narrower, for example? I haven't looked into it that far yet. <laughs> 
Were the instructions good enough just yes, to get yeah, you going? Yeah, they were fine, yeah. Good. How about you, John? Are you going to use a disaster? Out the news Utter, total, one hundred percent, unrelieved disaster. In fact, if John hadn't been here to help, we cheated. If he hadn't been here, well, it's still been looking at blank I, I screen. I advise him not to give up his daytime job. <laughs> I, don't think I did not understand any of the instructions. It wouldn't do anything I wanted it to do. Total but, shambles. Fair enough. You are winning now, aren't you? I don't think so. I mean, it's. Uh, I'm trying to do the last bit of it, and it keeps sort of stealing bits from here and. I was hearing a lot Ooh. of clattering and clacking going well, on. Well, I'm a, a two-finger typist. I type very fast and very inaccurately with two fingers, and I like old underwoods, you know, that you can hammer. And certainly <laughs> punishing you. I mean, do I, you think it's a fault in the package itself, or do you think it's the instructions? No, actually, the, <laughs> I, I didn't understand. I couldn't get it started at all. So I think, even though I'm not very bright, there must have been something wrong somewhere. We'll come back <laughs> to you later. And we'll be back again toward the end of the show to see their final results. Well, on Tuesday, one of Britain's biggest computer shows opens at the National Exhibition Centre in Birmingham. It's the Which Computer Show, so our guest editor this month is Lynn McTaggart from Which Magazine. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you. Well, Lynn, there seems to be quite a number of problems with computers these days. Now, your lead article in your this month's magazine, you've studied some of the um, retail outlets in chain stores and in departmental stores on the high street given them a problem, a business problem to solve, and found some remarkable results. I like the little bit here which says, um, the fact remains that while the majority of hardware and software recommended was excellent in its own right, nothing was capable of meeting our requirements as stated. And the other one that particularly pleased me was this remark. We eventually discovered the computer department on the fourth floor in the toy department behind Santa's grotto. <laughs> <laughs> was it really as bad as the article makes now? Yes. Uh, what we were telling was um, the, the supermarket chain stores that are growing up and so we had to fabricate a company called Surprise Publications. We chose a greeting card company because it has very specialist requirements. The accounts um, and the inv invoicing all get sandwiched around um, Christmas. We also, to throw a, a further monkey wrench in, we decided to make it sale a return policy which means no uh, typical off-the-shelf accounting package could meet our needs. We then took it around to 24 of these uh, dealers, and in every single case, they gave us the wrong advice. Um, was it, do you think it was a fair test? I mean, what sort of, what sort of people are these sales? I mean, surely in retail stores, they don't make a lot of money, and to expect them to be qualified accountants is really a bit much to ask them. Well, uh, yes, but I mean, they're not just claiming to sell you a kit. They claim that they can choose the right computer for your business. And so if they make that claim, what we were, we, what we were looking for is would they give us the right advice? In two cases, we couldn't even find the computer outlet. In another two cases, um, the youth serving us were under 21. One was playing Rocket Roger, a video game, while he was serving us. Um, <laughs> one fellow suggested that we um, treat surprises two companies, one that would send the bills and one that would send the credits. Um, another fellow s suggested that our warehouse manager and our accountant share a computer. And if you realize any kind of you know, any kind of real setup, that's impossible. How would you recommend anybody to go out and buy a computer then, a microcomputer? Uh, unless you've got very straightforward requirements, like word processing, I would um, steer clear of chain stores and go to either a specialist dealer, uh, a trained independent consultant, um, uh, push to have these stores get themselves a consultant, or educate yourself to be an aggressive consumer. Um, toward that end, we've put together a, a booklet that we're, we're offering free with January, which is um, a little checklist. So that it, when you're going to, um, to purchase a computer, you go and you ask the questions. Tell me about the show. Is there anything new and dramatic at the show that I should see? Uh, definitely. It's bigger than ever. Um, IBM it has its PCAT, which is the multi-user PC. Um, uh, Lotus has got a very exciting new package called Jazz for the uh, Macintosh um, to make a business computer. Um, There's a nice Data General portable with a big it's screen. It's a, lovely, a nice it, it's, it's a lovely portable. With it's probably one of the best we've, we've seen. And with anybody with £3,000 to spend, <laughs> it's a lot of money. Yes. Well, thank you very much, thank Lynn. You. And once again, the Which Computer Show is at the Birmingham Exhibition Centre next Tuesday to Friday. Well, some of you have been asking why MicroLive is so interested in telephones. Well, the main reason is that the most important growth area in computing is linking computers together by telephone lines. 
In addition, today's telephone service relies heavily on computers and many new phones have micros inside them. Fref has been to a phone shop in Manhattan. We've got possibly as many as 350 different telephones in the store running from uh, plain old phones, or as they call them, POTs, plain old telephones, uh, to feature phones, designer phones, and we've gotten to the point today where we have people who are decorating in the house will bring their interior designer with them to help choose the phones, and color becomes a very big factor. So I saw something over there that said Pierre Cardin on it, a nice little embossed gold. Right, we have Pierre Cardin phones, we have all the Cassini phones, and God knows who else will be around soon. What's the most advanced one you've got? Well, probably the, the DASA dialer, which is a, an instrument that's got a 400 number memory, and one of the features is as you program these 400 numbers into it, it automatically stacks them in alphabetical order. And then when you want to recall a number, all you do is hit the letter on the keyboard that you want to bring up. Let's say we want to bring up Smith. We'll hit S. The first S that's programmed will show up. But we don't want Samuels. We want Smith. So we hit SM. That brings up Smith. And then we can jump forward or backward with these buttons. Now that shows us Smith Joe. And we want to see a little bit about Mr. Joe Smith, so we hit the TV screen, and it scans across. Joe's, whatever we programmed into it, it holds 193 characters, name, address, phone number. My mother-in-law's birthday, that kind of Exactly. Thing. And then when the phone, when you're ready to dial it up, we hit the little picture of a telephone receiver. The phone number shows up, and in about five seconds, it'll dial out. And then we would just go ahead and have our conversation. When we're finished talking, we hit the button to hang up. We all know that the microprocessor technology, new electronics, is creating massive stuff, massive changes like the smartphones. What's the newest thing you've got, the future direction? Phones? Okay, the newest is cellular radio. This is so new that it's only been here for three weeks in New York City. Well, that's just a mobile telephone, though. That's... Well, it's a mobile phone, but what it is is up until now, the mobile phones that we've had for I don't know how many years, 10, 12 years, there's been of the 2,000 phones that are in use in New York, there are only 12 channels available. Wait, wait, you mean only 12 people could be using the phone at the same time exactly. in New York City? Only 12 people. It's a lot of busy signals. Isn't a it? lot of busy signals and never getting an incoming call. Uh, the cellular technology, more than 100,000 people can be using the phone at one time. Well, since it's mobile, can you call the shop? I certainly can. I'll walk outside and I'll be glad to call you. Great. I'm not sure this is as cracked up to be. Hello, Harvey? Hello. Yes, it sure does work. Thank you very much. I can see Fred filling his house with telephonic junk. Well, that was the situation in New York last summer, and now cellular radio telephones have finally arrived in the UK. Perhaps you've seen this advert. Party and party, solicitors. If you'd like to be in when you're out, ring Rachel Vodafone. <laughs> it's lovely. Well, how does that differ from ordinary radio telephones? Well, the basic problem with a radio telephone is the limit on the number of lines or channels available in a big city with one transmitter. Let's have a look at this little picture here. We've got our transmitter there in the middle, and there I am with my car driving across it. Every car would need a different frequency to communicate with that. And then in a large size city, you can imagine the clutter that it's going to get. And in fact, the number of lines is limited. Also, the distance is limited. And of course, nobody knows quite which city we're going to be in. With cellular radio, what happens is that the country or the town is divided into cells. And each of these cells is allocated a different frequency shown by these different colors. Now, we use much lower power transmitters. Of course, you need a lot more of them. So this group of of, of uh, cells here, this group of, of uh, lines here is not the same frequency, it's the same frequency as this group here, but the power isn't sufficient to communicate across there and interfere with them. Now, as you move from one cell to another, of course, something happens. Now, let's have a look what that is. Here is a group of cells, and there is a little transmitter in each of the cells, and I'm in my car in this particular cell here. I've called up, it's transmitted to the main transmitter, which links me into the main telephone network. 
and off I go, I drive across. Now the transmitter senses when the signal at the edge of the cell becomes very weak. It automatically allocates a new frequency from this transmitter and re-establishes a connection and that's really done by the computer itself. And it continues right across and here again another line has been allocated and communicated into the network. This means that I can be contacted wherever I'm located, wherever cellular radio is installed, and eventually it will be installed throughout 90% of Britain. At the present time, it's just major cities and on the motorways and some of the telephone, uh, some of the lines. So 90% of the city, 90% of England, you'll be able to phone at somebody in his car, and of course, you don't notice when you move from one cell to another, everything is perfectly smooth and transmission and reception is almost flawless. Well, in theory, it's a splendid idea, but what about the practice? Well, we've got Freff in New York, and we hope that he's on top of a skyscraper somewhere near the BBC offices in the Rockefeller Centre. We've got a camera looking at him. Oh, I can see him now. Hello, Freff. Um, we've no voice contact at all. So by now, Leslie should be at a secret location somewhere in West London, ready to make contact. Leslie, did you manage to get yourself a tandem? <laughs> uh, I couldn't get hold of a tandem, Mac. They're all hired out, so I've had to make do with one of Clive Sinclair's electric vehicles. Mind you, they get you from A to B and in some style as well. Incidentally, uh, Snoopy on the top there is an optional extra. Right, now then, I've got my cellular radio phone here. That's it. You see, no cables attached at all, completely portable. Take the handset off. Now, Freff's New York telephone number is pretty long, so I've uh, preset it in the memory. I'll just call it up. 01. Now you get a visual display to check that you've got the right number. And when that comes up, where's it gone? No, hang on, I'll cancel that and try again. See what's happening there. Okay, let's have another go. Now let's have a look. No, I'm not having a lot of joy with this. Just try once more, otherwise I'm going to have to call in a tame techie from somewhere. Let's have a little look. We've got... See if I get the number up this time. Yes! <laughs> Success. Send the call down the line. Great. Now, there'll be about a 15-second delay here while it connects up with the international lines. These really are incredible. This is quite a large uh, version of the equipment. But nevertheless, as you can see, totally portable. They do come smaller. And really, at £1,300, they're half the price of the existing radio telephones. And it's ringing! Oh, if luck's on my side, Freff will answer in a minute. Hello, Freff. Is that Freff on the roof? Uh, yeah, Leslie in a car, I guess. It's Freff on an extremely cold roof. Oh, I can see you now. You've got snow there. A lot of it, and it's coming down faster and faster. I can barely see the city, and I'm right here. Can you see anything? Uh, not a lot. Listen, let's get down to business in that case, because you look so cold. Okay. You've had cellular radio telephones around for, what, nine months now in New York? Approximately How nine months in New York, yeah. How's the system going? Has it taken off? It's doing very well. In fact, they've hit their subscriber goal of 10,000 a little early, and they expect by 1985's end to have about 25,000 subscribers in the New York area. There's about, uh, there's right now there's 12,000 in this area. Yep. There's about 100,000 nationwide. They've got 28 of the 30 target cities wired up to go. Well, and, what, uh, what, is the American, what is the American target, Fref? I mean, we're aiming to cover 90%. Are you going to go coast to coast with this? They tell me by the end of the decade we'll be coast to coast. Uh, as I say, they're almost finished with the first 30 cities and they're starting with the 30 after that. That's great. Listen, um, we've been talking about uh, the big new business computer show that's opening uh, over here next week. And I believe you've got something, uh, I believe you've got something similar running in the States, haven't you? Did you see anything there Just that you liked? Finishing up. Well, I saw some great stuff. The most important news for computer buyers is probably Atari, which Tramiel bought, of course, earlier. And he's coming out with a whole new line of computers, one of which is a Macintosh look-alike, which has been nicknamed the Jackintosh here in this industry. What's important about that machine is that while it acts like a Macintosh in all respects, it's in color instead of black and white, and they say they're going to sell it for $400. Wow, well, listen, amazing. another innovation from the States, no doubt we'll get here next year. Fref, I've got to sign off now. It's been lovely to talk to you. I hope next time we might be face-to-face. -face. Give, Give us a wave, Fref. Give us a wave. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, <laughs> bye -bye. Of Great. course. Well, listen, since you can never have too much of a good thing, here's Freff yet again on the west coast of America. I think with delusions of great.
Bondia. I'm sure he's been watching too many movies. Right, you've made it to Hollywood and things are going great. The studios love your script, they're pouring money into it hand over fist, and Clint Eastwood and Charlton Heston are both arguing over who gets to play the lead. There's only one problem. The big finale. You know, the one with those intergalactic sharks from the 19th dimension. Have built a Death Star, defeated our space fleet, and are on their way to Earth to obliterate London and part the Red Sea. How are you going to film that? Where are you going to film that? Well, most likely you'll come to one of several anonymous buildings scattered around Los Angeles where the wizards of special effects use the best of old film technology with new computer technology to make the movies real. The special effects for the film 2010 were created at Boss Films, where nothing is quite what it seems. Roll nitrogen. The day we were there, they were filming one element for a shot of the spaceship Leonov entering the atmosphere of Jupiter. In fact, it's just the disembodied engines surrounded by nitrogen vapor. Roll camera. Rolling. Later, they'll film other elements, the rest of the spaceship, the background and so on, and they will be combined to produce the finished scene. This technique is called motion control photography. The movements of the camera are precisely controlled by a microcomputer, so each pass has exactly the same camera move, and We're the there. separate elements of the scene will be perfectly aligned. And each one of those passes will be done at a different exposure time, perhaps have different filters in front of the camera. And each one of those separate elements then can be combined in an optical printer to create the illusion that you'll see in the final film that there's a real spaceship rather than a small miniature. Okay, so the model never moves, it's just the camera. Uh, sometimes the model moves, but normally the model does sit static and the camera moves. And the reason for that is, is for lighting, all the lights that are associated with a uh, model would have to move if it moved too, usually. So it's easier if you deal with a fixed model for lighting problems. Jerry, you were there from the very beginning of motion control in films, weren't you? That's what I hear. I was there on the start of Star Wars. <laughs> Was that the first time it was used in film? Uh, yes, that was the first use of motion control photography in m at least major motion pictures and a combination because I guess that it worked and the film was so successful, it's sort of an industrial standard now. But it was pretty primitive in those days. Oh, yes, compared to what's done today, the things that we use then I'm sure would probably raise a laugh. But on the other hand, some of the original equipment was used as recently as the making of Ghostbusters. Like uh, the original ice box that was used on Close Encounters of the Third Kind was used for some of the photography in Ghostbusters and some in uh, the upcoming film, 2010. How much power did that have? Actually, a fair amount, considering that it's not a microprocessor-based system. It's a system of hardware and logic. And it's probably about as powerful as a small throwaway handheld calculator that you, the bank gives you today for opening a new account. But then it was made 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, who could have imagined this beast. It's a Cray XMP supercomputer, the most powerful computer in the world, and it's being used by digital productions in Los Angeles in a way that may mean the end of conventional special effects photography. The spaceships in this scene from The Last Starfighter have never existed as plastic models. Instead, they've been created entirely as computer graphic images. They start as sketches on an electronic drafting table. The system allows the designer to try out moves and camera angles before storing the images in the computer's memory for later use. After the model is created and the motion is done, all the files are transferred over to the Cray. And at that time, then, you can take any frame that you've created and look at it in a shaded, uh, rendered form as though now you're looking at solid objects rather than a wireframe. And uh, that work goes on, uh, the computations, all the calculations are done by the Cray. This is the area where we really use the, the power of the supercomputer because uh, the Cray runs uh, somewhere between uh, 200 and a billion uh, calculations per second. And the reason why we need that speed is because you may have a scene, a frame, which is going to be rendered at a, at a, a resolution of, say, uh, 6,000 by 6,000 uh, pixels. Now, that's, uh, that's 36 million picture elements on the display itself. 
and there's no telling how many calculations it takes to figure out each one. It may be, be as billions. high as a million, a billion, you know, it, it, can, it easily runs into several billion computations per frame of film. It takes the Cray about an hour to do the calculations for one second of film. That kind of computing power doesn't come cheap. If you're thinking of upgrading your ZX81, it'll cost you about ten and a half million dollars. Even at that price, some of the shots in Starfighter are obviously computer generated. The flaws with digital uh, techniques today probably are mainly in that the problem isn't understood well enough. I think that they probably have the resolution to do the job. Uh, I think they have a long way to go to learn how to light things so that they look real. It's very hard to recreate uh, reality uh, and or even to recreate the kind of reality that you see in a, in a movie. So it's true, computers lend themselves very easily to doing uh, metallic. Uh, things which look like they were made by a machine are easily done by a computer. Uh, metal surfaces which are perfectly smooth or perfectly rounded. Uh, it's very hard to create the kind of irregularity that you find in nature. There's no doubt that over the last 10 years, computers have revolutionized the special effects industry. And the use of digital animation techniques is giving directors greater and greater freedom, even from the laws of physics. But it's worth remembering that so far, it still takes people to have the ideas. Well, Fref always seems to get the best jobs, except for on top of that skyscraper, it did look a little bit chilly. In the November show, we announced our integrated software project. Three people who wrote to us with the most interesting and unusual idea for using a software package that included word processing, database management, spreadsheet, graphics and communications would each receive a business microcomputer, integrated software and training. Well, we had over 800 entries. Many of them were very well worked out and we've had a difficult time deciding on the final three. There was very hot competition for our offer and it was not an easy choice. Well, among our final shortlist was a salmon farmer near Glasgow, a small post office in Dorset, and a deep-sea diver. Unfortunately, none of the many vicars who wrote in made it to the final stages. We did receive this from the Reverend Taffy Davis, who claims to be the only cartoon-drawing computer literate vicar. As you can see, he's bursting with ideas for computerising God's work, including a very imaginative, uh, imaginative idea for dealing with cash flow. Let's hope he doesn't get caught to account. However, we can now say that the winners were Michael Inskip, who runs a small catering business with his wife in Newport Pagnell, Bob Gregory, the Brighton sales manager of the National Mutual Life Assurance Company, and Ken Hurst, who's the secretary of the Grimethorpe Colliery Brass Band. Well, the three we finally chose spent a couple of days last week at the headquarters of the software company, Lotus, where they had their first experience of the software. into us. We'll be following them up over the next few months to see how they cope when they get their machines back home. Well now it's time to take a final look at how our word processing challenge, <laughs> our word processing challenge is progressing. John, how's oh. it going? How's everybody? <laughs> what's the overview? Um, the overview is good in parts. Some people have managed very easily and others have really, um, sorry John, have got disasters. <laughs> Kate, What's your impression? <laughs> what have you found that's good and what's better? Well, I've had a bit of a problem here with the pound signs. They came up on the screen, but when I printed it out, they didn't register at all. That's a serious lesson to learn, that you better make sure that the, the, the characters that you want to print out are actually on the printer that you buy. <laughs> Some do have dollar signs instead of pound signs and yeah. so on. This one, I think, has been really amazingly easy and very much one of the most successful ones. It's, it's view on the bead machine. But your secretary, that, I think, has made it easier. And also, on the screen, you've been able to see exactly what the printout's going to look like. So it makes it relatively easy, and, and you know, Kate's obviously found that a great help. In the sense that the, you can see all the full width of the letter on the screen, yes. because it's an 80-character yes. screen. That's the difference between 80 and 40 yes. characters, I guess. Compare, um, we, we've had a... <laughs> John, <laughs> John, how's it going? Well, <laughs> thank you for I your had, inquiries. If I had, thank you. If I had to write my stories for the nine o'clock news on this particular machine it would get on the air if we were lucky by midnight <laughs> two years later I have a copy I have in my hand a piece of paper I have a copy of, of, uh, of something that I produced but as you can see if you're looking it's a shambles it's full of mistakes and it would never have been created at all if John here had what was the difficult 
What you found? Was it with the instructions? I couldn't understand the instructions. Well, I mean, I did what they told me to do, and it didn't seem to work. And I think John would agree with me that even when he tried it himself, it wasn't... Uh, you had to know something about computers to me. And I know nothing about computers. I bought a BBC B a year ago, and I've never actually used it, because I was afraid of it after I got it at home. And it, in fact, you used a phrase at one stage, John. You said, uh, we're not in control. And I thought, my God, I've never not been in control of a typewriter before. And I just wasn't... I didn't know how to make it go. Thank you, John. That? Well, the best of luck. I hope we persevere and come no, out with the I've news one down I'm here. going back to a 1912 <laughs> Underwood. <laughs> Bernard, how have you found the Commodore 64? Well, I'm the sort of person that has the odd problem problem with uh, soup packets, understanding the instructions on soup packets, so this has proved a bit of a challenge. Uh, by and large, though, I've managed to type the second half of the letter fairly wrongly, otherwise I've done splendidly. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we did get a printout, though, fair enough, and, and in fact it's not bad. The worst problem here was just getting going, and it was a good ten off, minutes or so before the you know, we'd begun to get into the thing at all. I yes, think now, now you're into it, so you could probably yes, make it work. I think, I think starting is the problem, and after that, the fact that the fingers don't do what they're supposed to do is another factor. In other words, bad typing as well as... Or, as well, well, of as course, the it's meant to aid bad typing by being able to rapidly correct some of the mistakes. Did you find the sheet of paper given enough instructions it to was, use it? It was opaque to me. The instructions were <laughs> not, not, not easily, easily understood. That wasn't the phrase that was used earlier, but... That's and uh, the keyboard is difficult as well in terms of touch. Otherwise... Do you think you'd have been better off reading a full manual? I think it would have been better to have started at the beginning and have the whole book. Yes. So you can't just plunge into it and, I th and just have I think have it's a go. asking a lot. I think it needs a slow beginning, otherwise panic sets in pretty quickly. You see, again, this one here, uh, you don't have on the screen the same output as you're going to get on the printer. And that's incredibly off-putting for, for beginning users. In rehearsals, we had exactly the same problem, that um, users for the first time really want to see on the screen what was going to come out of the printer. So this really isn't a machine you would necessarily buy for word processing. Well, not this itself, particular no. piece of software. It's you could use word processing on it if you had it, but not right. easy. Right. Gil, how have you come on? Are you a good well, typist? I've got something here. Yes. Oh, yes, that's not very bad at all, is it? I knew how In to tear fact, this paper off. I will tear it off. Right, here we've got the, we Spectra, uh, the QL with uh, the Quill software. And on the screen, pretty much, uh, is what you get on output, uh, on the printout. So it hasn't been too bad, really, has it? Well, it, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, this, first of all, I'm not used to a flat keyboard like that, so I'm going like that. I'm, I'm used to this up, upward thing. Right. Um, I type faster than it comes out here, which I find very bewildering, because I'm, I'm used to watching as I type. I'm a touch typist. And as I type, it hasn't happened yet. Right. That's very that, strange, because it's quite a powerful machine, is that? Why is it, that, John? It is indeed. Uh, it's just the way they've got type ahead, they call it, so it allows you to type ahead, but you do find it uh, very difficult at first. Although I to say some electric typewriters have the same facility. Yes, they do. Yes. I've got one of them that I don't use. It, it? <laughs> yes. it is. How do yes. you find the error correction and so on? Would that well, be I've been trying to get rid of that E for the last <laughs> ten yeah. minutes. I cannot do it. And that is one of the terrible things, I think, that you feel completely frustrated. You look, you try, and nothing happens. Mm. With a manual thing which I'm used to you're you're able to do something about it if only take out a screwdriver yes <laughs> one, of, one of the things that everybody's commented on in fact is that they didn't know how to delete things and they got quite worried when they found things on the screen they couldn't cope with now, because once you show people it's quite easy a second time we had another problem here and that was that uh, the screen the text on the screen was centered all the time we got into a mode Hello, oh, yeah, I'm just eavesdropping here oh, yeah. <laughs> we got into a mode where everything was centered in the line and we couldn't find an easy yes, way out. that's right okay. it, yeah. after we'd solved the problem it was all right but off putting it first. Well, yes, mm. but I pressed the help button and uh, up came this uh, a great deal of words um, and I didn't know that you had to say um, enter again. It does not say... I'm sure you've just hit on the problem that I found. Going straight into word processing, no knowledge of yes. computers. Yes. Perhaps really we should say we didn't, you you to, we didn't allow you to look at the manual at all. So yes. We made it really very difficult. Mm, right. Our next programme comes live from British Telecom's Research Centre at Martlesham Heath. So be looking out for us on the 8th of February. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.